Yeah. It's said that the Druids sang the stones here. Yeah. Well, in a case, that might be actually no, they true. Sing, they sang the rocks. They sang the rocks, they sang the stones. Because what's singing but a sound? What's a sound? Nothing more than the true vibration of something. No, yeah? yeah. So, stone vibrates at a certain rate. Right? Everything has a vibration, That's nothing right. is actually still. If, and there's an old law of magic saying that if you know a thing's true name, right. its sound or its vibration, then you can control it. So, if I know the sound of the stone, its vibration, I can sing it and I can make it light and I can levitate it and I can control it. Oh, I was the, the finishing foreman for Amy Construction and we did a simulation. We moved guys, all the stones over here in less than two weeks yeah. with the amount of people required. And all it was done is we were dragging the, ch and the, ch the children would go ahead and trample the snow into ice. And yeah. this came on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you did this. And, and we, we did the exercise. I, mean, okay. I was the finishing foreman for Amy Construction. Obviously Amy and Westman of that and we did a simulation and we had the stones here in no time at all we thought okay. let me across all of that and all you need is a couple hundred children walking ahead trampling down the oxen draggers on the outside right and <laughs> we have no friction we'll get it we brought the lot over in less than two weeks with okay. the same yeah, amount of men that they said if it was dry done right mm. whoa Oh, don't that, do it in the summer. Don't, 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 no, don't, no, no, don't, no, don't, no, don't, no, don't go down no, that avenue. We've, we've, yeah, but the Druids have known please, please, for years. Please, please. You know what I mean? The Druids have known for years. What do you do in the winter? You build monuments that's because right. that's the best time to move the stone. Well, not only is it the best short. time to move the stone, every, everybody is too busy bringing in the harvest any yeah. earlier yeah. Oh, because well, you are a, you're in tune with nature. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and also it's the easiest time. Snow, you know, yeah. it's sledges and snow, any kid, sledges and any kid, and ice. You know, they don't need any intelligence. Oh look, this will slide and they're <laughs> off like yeah. anything. Right, so for, to do it for this, in a concerted effort to bring the stones over, heck, we had no problems with And uh, Larry Dolly, who was the GM for this thing, has gone, where do you get your ideas from? This is, we'd never have thought of. Yeah. So, yeah, well, you know, this is how, if you're looking at the logistics of the time, those people probably had better, colder snow, crisper snow yeah. conditions. Then, yeah, it, when these were moved, so okay, in magic time we had them over. <laughs> There's a way of getting all the stones and don't record forget, time in record time, and that's only the small stones. The big stones came from 20 miles over there in Melbourne Downs. Yeah, they didn't come that far, they didn't it's come only the far. small ones that came from Wales. Yeah, the okay. big, it's only the blue stones that came from Wales, the big stones, the trilithons, they go 20 miles away. So no. too much has been caught by the media and twisted yeah. to serve the public purpose and the uh, various, think... various publications. Okay. I mean, money, the, the print trade depends <laughs> on all these books selling to the public. <coughs> and to be supportive of one another, uh, uh, the archaeologists and writers, you see, they all support each other and not contradict that way the product sells. That does not tell the truth. No, you know, because the truth, the truth is, that. a lot of people, <laughs> if they have heard of Stonehenge, have probably <coughs> heard that it came from the Sally or something came from the Sally. Yeah. So they assume that they all came from there, and it's not true. Some of them came from less than 20 miles away. Okay. Yet, yes, there are a lot of them that did come from the Sally, which is a couple of hundred miles away. Yeah, that was absolutely no trouble bringing yeah. them. You do it in winter when you've got the manpower because nobody wants to come in winter except survive. So so what, what, uh, I mean, the, the blue stones, I actually believe, were a circle originally. We're a circle in Priscelli because uh, of the way they are and the way they're shaped. I think it was a circle that was dismantled and brought, and brought here and put, and I think it was actually here. And I'm, I, I agree with uh, Mike Parker Pierce, the. Um, Archaeologist? The, the head of the Riverside Project, in as it's not a coincidence that there's the same many blue stones as there are Aubrey Holes. So I actually believe that they were in a circle outside what we now see as Stonehenge. And then the trilithons were put up and then they were moved inside. Okay. And that's where 
the Albury holes, and one of the things he'd done this summer to prove this theory was when they took out the cremated remains that we're demanding they return back from Albury Hole 7, he went deeper than he went in 1936 and he found that yes, it was a post hole, there were stones in there. Well, the near number shows me that it's got to be the blue stones, so they were in a circle, put in in a horseshoe after the trilithons were put up, and when they were moved in, that's when I believe the cremated remains were put in the empty pits from those holes as guardians around the temple. And it's those cremated remains that they've taken away. If you'd like to go back, I'd just like to say a few words. And those are words that you, the war band, have heard before. My name is Arthur. I am Pete. What? and future born to be Celtic chieftain knight of old I am the story as told loyal knights has come to me bowing to their destiny where'er we find the we right wrong well that must always be our fault the cauldron and the cross unite Christian and pagan join our fight reunite the Celtic creed in its time of greatest need arrive from Avalon, 87, Arthur Pendragon, June 11. And that was when I wrote that one, and of course, 22 years later, the 11th of June, this year, well, as some of you know, who were with me back then, I was a little urchin, with a bit of fat cloth. Now, I'm a senior druid and a battle chieftain. So, I must be doing something right, because when I went for that quest, I decided if it was real, the goddess would provide. I have not yet signed on in 22 years, nor do I intend to. I remain in the service of the goddess. And by the sun, I re-pledge my allegiance to the land. Uh, I wouldn't agree necessarily that this was the Temple for the Dead, which is his latest theory. No, um, for the living as yes, well as the dead. Yeah, yeah, but, but it's, it's, it, it's a, it's a yeah, gathering but, point, but when certainly the, two times a year, because it is aligned to the, we, to the dawn sunrise yeah, of London only the day, do and the like the uh, exactly. sunset on so the um, shortest day, whatever, so, so it's a gathering point, really. So, and you're not just going to gather for the dead, you're also going to gather for the living. So it's a gathering point and a season of clock. Sorry, oh, you're okay. <laughs> no problem. It, it, it's a meeting place. It, it, it's an early... It's a place of, of knowledge, of learning. It's a meeting place of place knowledge. Of... of course it is, because you come and the druids, or whoever they were, the proto-druids, look at shadow and say, okay. And, and then you just look at the words and look at the root of the words. Solstice, sun, still, because the sun yeah, appears on yeah. the horizon for three days to be in the same place. So the ancients knew that. So the Equinox ancients knew equal, equal night. So, so the ancients knew exactly what time of year it was because of that. So that was the first sundial, if you like, and it was a seasonal sundial, not a daily sundial. That was built originally to tell what time of year it was. And if you've got a big clock like that somewhere on the on the aisles, somewhere here, right, in the middle of Salisbury Plain, then people from all the different tribes are going to come and see it. But they're not going to come and see it on any day of the year. They're going to want to see how it works. They're going to come and see it on the longest day or the shortest day. So it's going to become a gathering point. Oh, Whichever way you look at it. And one, once you start gathering twice a year at the longest and the shortest days, it doesn't take you too long to work out the equal days. Then people gather four times a year. Then it becomes sacred. Then it goes into the ethos of a temple. Prior to that, it's just a giant sundial because the people who built it were the scientists of their day. So they built that. And they were the, the, the wizards, the wise men, whatever way you call it, the druids. So anyway, they, they built that and it was used specifically for a purpose and that was to tell what time of year it was. People wanted to see how it worked so people would gather at those times of year. They would, that would then make it sacred, make it, give it temple sort of status and people would come from all over the country to be here on the longest and shortest day. And that's basically why it became a temple, why it became sacred, why somebody bothered to put cremated remains around it. And when you look at the numbers,